Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. We go beyond the forecast here to give you the how and why on all of the cool and interesting things you've wondered about and wanted to ask in weather, space, and science. And today we're talking about space and particularly space travel. How far we've come since the first human ventures into the space world. Uh, they began in the 1960s and a renewed interest recently regarding getting humans to the moon and beyond. So joining us now to talk more about space travel is AccuWeather astronomy expert Brian Leda. Uh, Brian, thanks so much for making time for us here today. We always love talking to you about uh, the world of space. Yeah, I love space. You know, I'm a meteorologist by trade, but right. I've always had a passion for it. So thanks for having me. Well, this is good stuff. And you coordinate uh, a lot of our space and astronomy coverage here on the AccuWeather Network and also on social media, AccuWeather.com. You have a big love of astronomy and space and uh, that married into your meteorology background real well here for us at AccuWeather. Of course, yeah, you know, if there's a big astronomy event, you need good weather to see it. And we've had some big ones lately out there. So let's start with the evolution of space travel and how far we've come uh, since the 1960s. So tell us a little bit about these early rocket launches uh, and the race to space. So when you think about NASA, Jeff, one of the first things that comes to mind is landing on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, Apollo 11, and all of that was during the height of the space race. But really the space race started in the late 1950s and Russia took the early lead. They were the first ones to launch a satellite into space, first ones to launch a person into space, person to orbit the Earth, uh, a woman in space. So they had almost every kind of first you could think about. So NASA was playing catch up a lot of the time. And when you compare it to today, all the technology and computers we have, they had the bare essentials and they were creating and innovating as they went. So it's amazing the accomplishments they were able to achieve, not just to get a human to the moon, but to do it by the end of the 1960s, which of course the United States won the space race by landing on the moon in July of 1969. And Russia, they did have one last throw of the dice. Uh, they had a rocket that was supposed to send humans to the moon, but it had a lot of bugs with it. So right before Apollo 11 launched, they actually launched a robot to go up and scoop up a piece of lunar soil and bring it back to Earth. So at least they could lay claim to that, but it was unfortunately for them, uh, unsuccessful mission. So United States, you know, not just getting the first person on the moon, but bringing back the first rocks from another world. And planting the flag on there as well, which is really cool stuff. Well, after the moon program, NASA's focus seemed to change a little bit. So where did the uh, focus shift away from the moon? Yeah, so when it was clear that Russia, you know, they were giving up their intentions going to the moon and it, there was a lot happening, it was a cold war, uh, a lot happening in America, and it took a lot of money and effort for us to go to the moon at the time we did. So NASA's budget really started to get hedged back, and so we couldn't go to the moon anymore. So NASA had to pivot. And that's really when we started to see the shift from human exploration to science. And they started to focus on things like satellites and uh, focusing on low Earth orbit and things like the start of the space shuttle program, which helped build the International Space Station, which we still use today. So really the 1970s after the moon, pro the moon program was canceled, that was a flashpoint for NASA to get us where we are today. And when we were young, it was all about the government run NASA uh, program uh, as really our only hope uh, at getting to space. But now things have shifted a little bit into the private sector. Uh, and we've seen uh, companies like SpaceX and uh, other companies as well getting involved. So what kind of a role does NASA have today? Well, as he said, it, for a while there it was just NASA because it takes a lot of resources and a lot of money to get to space. But over the years we had these companies arrive. Uh, the past couple of years, SpaceX has been a huge name. Uh, Blue Origin is another rising company. United Launch Alliance has a brand new rocket. So all these different private companies are kind of making their own way in space and it's helping out NASA because NASA can't do it all. So while NASA trains astronauts and operates the International Space Station and has probes and rovers all across the solar system, these private companies like SpaceX, they can launch things to the International Space Station, whether it be supplies or astronauts themselves. And all these different companies, you know, competition is good for innovation. So with all these different companies, it's kind of forcing them to do something that we've never done before. So SpaceX, they're reusing rockets, which once was science fiction, now they do it on a regular basis. And so every company, they're kind of trying to help out the way they can with NASA while also trying to succeed in their own way. And uh, we talked a little bit about this ahead of time, but is there a time, at least in our lifetimes, or maybe uh, our kids' generation, when space travel will be as common as air travel, when regular people, uh, not necessarily just the, the uh, economic elite, 
have a shot at going to space recreationally? Well, Jeff, I want to say yes, and I believe the answer is yes, uh, because there is a lot of demand there. Uh, right now it is, you know, mostly really rich people that can afford to go to space, but there's a lot of people that want to go, and there's simply just not enough rockets. You know, there's a long waiting list just to get on a ride to space. Uh, there's private companies out there, Blue Origin's doing it a lot, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX is launching some people, but simply uh, there's a lot of demand but not a lot of supply. So I think we just need a lot more rockets, a lot more facilities to launch the rockets before we get to you know, a, a high cadence of launches where not just rich people can go, but anyone could go, where it does one day become something like flying in an airplane. You know, right. A lot of people do that every single day, and that's kind of the direction where we're heading, but it's going to take a while to get there. Okay. Well, uh, the moon, about 238,000 miles away, um, you know, about 3,000 miles between New York and L.A., so it's not that far away, but I suspect if you're traveling to the moon, you're not necessarily making a straight line path. So how long does it actually take to get to the moon? Well, back in the Apollo era, it was taking them around three days to get there. They'd be at the moon for a day or two and then a couple days to get home. And so it all depends on how you want to get there. If you just want to crash a rocket into the moon, you can get there pretty quick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hard landing, though. Yeah, but if you want the return trip home, you need to take a bit of a slower method because you need fuel to come back and everything, and you need to, you know, the orbits to get around the moon and come back to the Earth. So actually, NASA's Artemis program coming up to return humans to the lunar surface, uh, it's going to be about a month-long mission. So launching, orbiting the Earth, going to the moon, and instead of spending one or two days on the moon, they're going to be spending about a week on the moon. So that's a lot more time to do science and explore the lunar surface to help us learn about the moon before coming back home. You have to pack a few lunches for that trip. <laughs> well, uh, it is time for our first viewer question. This comes to us from Jeff in Florida, and Jeff writes, my question is about going back to the moon. So if we sent men uh, to the moon in the late 1960s and early 1970s, why is it so difficult for us to do it again? Why why haven't we done it more recently? Uh, and, uh, you know, are, are we going to be doing it again sometime soon? You answered part of that question, but why haven't we done it again in the 70s, the 80s, and 90s? Well, I'll answer that with another question. How come you can't go out right now and buy a brand new Ford Model T car? And that's because uh, what we need out of cars and the technology that goes into cars has changed over the years and evolved past that first form. And, you know, the Saturn V rocket that got us to the moon, that's kind of like the, the Ford Model T, where it was great at the time, but then when we didn't need to go to the moon anymore, uh, we didn't need that rocket anymore. So all the infrastructure to build it, you know, got repurposed or what have you. So really, we don't have the factory to build a moon rocket. So we need to start from scratch and build a brand new facility that could build brand new rockets that could do, you know, more technology and have more advancements to them compared to those first times. And since NASA doesn't have the budget like it had in the 60s, uh, it's just taking a lot longer to do. But we are getting there. And NASA is going to, hopefully, as the plan goes, uh, have astronauts on the surface of the moon before 19, or 19, uh, t before 2030. Okay. So to an extent, it sounds a little bit like for a time it was kind of a bucket list item. We checked that box and there were other things to explore uh, that may have de-incentivized making that a huge priority in the 1980s, for example. Yeah, but it is still a priority because there's still a lot of science to learn with going to the moon. Very cool. Well, uh, are there any plans or is there any incentive to use the moon as a secondary launch base? There actually is because you got to crawl before you could run. Okay. <laughs> and the long-term goal is to get humans to Mars. So if you you got to get to the moon before you go to Mars. So one idea is we build a base on the moon and then launching a rocket from the moon will be way simpler to get to Mars than if we're launching directly from the Earth. So that is one of the things that they're considering. That's still a long ways away, though. So a couple ideas are being thrown around, but, you know, we got to get to the moon first. That's the first priority before we could go to those bigger goals of Mars or beyond. Is that because there's less gravity to overcome? Yeah, that's okay. one of it. It's a lot easier to launch a rocket because there's less gravity there. Okay. But, of course, too, you need to get everything to the moon before you can launch it to Mars. That makes so sense. It, you got to balance what, uh, the pros and cons. Okay. And in the long run, do you think this renewed interest in the private sector getting more involved uh, is going to help accelerate the process of getting back to the moon? I think so. NASA's already leaning on some partners like SpaceX to get back to the moon. NASA's not just doing it themselves. Uh, so they're asking these private companies to build things or to help with the process, not only to make it easier for NASA, but maybe along the way, SpaceX might say, hey, we could do this too. NASA, you can go to the moon, but we're going to go as well. 
So that is also a possibility and one of the many opportunities when it comes to this, you know, the private sector of space launches. It's all very fascinating and uh, well, we appreciate your insight into this. Uh, and, you know, Brian, we're going to have plenty more time to talk about some other topics here kind of adjacent to some of the things we've discussed. And coming up also a little later in WeatherWise, we're going to find out how a lightning strike in 1987 changed the rules for NASA launches. After all, they do a lot there in the lightning capital of the nation. And that's coming up in our segment, Yeah, That Really Happened. Also, after a brief landing, our conversation about space travel will take off yet again as we look into traveling into places beyond the moon when Ask the Experts continues. Stay with us here on the AccuWeather Network. AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish, and today we're going out of this world with our AccuWeather astronomy expert, Brian Leda. And Brian is back with us as we talk more about space travel, the past, present, and looking to the future. So, Brian, we were discussing going back to the moon before the break, and um, it's on the horizon. Uh, but uh, let's talk about some of the inherent dangers that we still face as humans traveling uh, into space. In a nutshell, with even better technology, it's hard to fight the sheer incapability of humans between humans and space. We're not uh, compatible, I should say. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. We're not compatible for space. And uh, there's more to it than just equipment. You know, you think Apollo 13, they thought fast on their feet to bring those astronauts home safe. And we have things to help us in that regard now. 3D printers. If there's a tool that breaks or a part, we might be able to print it in space so we could have a replacement. But when you, humans, as you go farther away from the Earth, that's when you become more vulnerable to space because of radiation. You know, astronauts on the International Space Station, they're still protected a bit from Earth's magnetic field. But if you're talking about a trip to the moon or somewhere like Mars where you're outside of that protection, you can have long-term health effects with astronauts because of all that radiation. You know, going to Mars, uh, <laughs> two-year trip, round trip, that's the shortest possible. Wow. So that's a long time to be exposed to radiation. But also the health of the astronauts in the short term, being in space, you could have uh, muscle loss, bone density lowers, your eyes can actually have issues. And those are issues that we're still trying to challenge and try to solve, even though we've been going to space for so long. Uh, so one of the many hurdles when it comes to space travel. Are there plans to go beyond the moon? And can we make it to Mars or other destinations in the solar system uh, in the relatively near future? Well, after the moon, Mars is the next target because first off, it's close to the Earth. Second off, in our whole solar system, it's the planet that's most like Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes sense for us to go there. But even though it's relatively close on space terms, it is incredibly far away. <laughs> so there's a lot that we need to do before we can get to that point. You know, we got to go to the moon first, make sure all of our ducks are in a row. We know exactly what we're doing because we need to make sure everything goes right if we go on a trip to Mars. I like messing with uh, my kids and uh, reminding them that Mars is the only planet in inhabited entirely by robots. Correct, yeah. But it's true, and, it's, uh, you know, and I've always been amazed over the past three or four years, we've seen some of the imagery here, and you're looking at it right now, uh, from the Mars rover, and you know, it looks a lot like the desert southwest. It's, it's not that different compared to you know, Venus or some of these other planets where you may not even be able to land physically. Yeah, and NASA actually sent astronauts to train out in parts of the West because uh, the surface of Mars is kind of similar to the moon where there's a bunch of jagged rocks. Uh, so it's a great place to train if you're an astronaut to kind of uh, get the closest representation of an otherworldly surface like that. Pretty cool. Looks pretty dry, though. Well, NASA has sent multiple rovers and even a helicopter to Mars. So uh, why go through the effort to send humans to the planet if we already have cameras and we can get to rocks and things like that and explore them at least remotely? Well, robots are great. Uh, we have two nuclear-powered robots up there, Curiosity and Perseverance, uh, powered by plutonium. So they don't need to rely on the sun for energy or anything. And they can run around and do some science, but they're very limited because they need to be controlled by us here on Earth. So even if you want to drive the rover 10 feet, you know, it takes a couple minutes for a radio signal to go one way. So NASA needs to write a program, send it to the rover, takes a couple of minutes, then it needs to drive 10 feet and making sure nothing's in its way to prevent it. And then it takes a couple more minutes for us to find out if it actually did that. And that's just driving forward, let alone doing science experiments. Now, if we have an astronaut on the surface of Mars, 
give them a shovel and they could dig a hole. <laughs> so uh, that's a lot easier to make you know, observations and find discoveries and what have you. But getting humans to Mars is much more difficult than getting a rover. So there's certainly pros and cons of both ways. Uh, and I think even after you know, we send humans to Mars, we'll still send rovers there too because there's a lot that they can do. Pretty fascinating, and uh, what a test of patience for somebody trying to control something with like a 10 minute delay between beginning to see uh, that uh, activity actually take place. Uh, well, uh, what is NASA hoping to find when we do go back to the moon in the short term? Well, one of the things with going to the moon, we're going somewhere we haven't gone before, and that's somewhere around the South Pole. And one reason behind that is because NASA thinks that there could be water in the form of ice. And if you find water, that's a valuable resource in space, not only for astronauts if you need to drink it, but it could be potentially used for other factors as well. So if we could find some sort of water on the moon, that would be a game changer. Plus two, who knows, if they find gold or other material that's crucial to life on Earth, that could blow open the doors to a whole new space race. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, you never know. Well, we want to get to our next viewer question. This comes to us from Steve in Pennsylvania. And Steve, what would you like to ask the expert? You know, I remember the Challenger disaster and that cold air that was such a factor in that disaster. What can they do going forward, just kind of keeping weather in mind and weather conditions uh, for future rocket launches? Well, weather is more important than ever before uh, because we have new rockets that have new weather constraints compared to things like the space shuttle. But also, too, you look at SpaceX, they're not just launching rockets, they're landing rockets in the ocean. So you need to make sure that the weather in the ocean is good. If there's rough surf or high winds and they can't land that rocket properly, then that throws off their whole launch schedule. So uh, weather is more important than it ever has been when it comes to launching rockets. That makes good sense. Wave heights, things like this uh, that uh, you wouldn't necessarily initially think about, uh, but it's all very relevant. Uh, but we appreciate all your insight. Once again, Brian, I love talking to you about the world of space and space travel especially. Uh, and thanks again for joining us uh, to, again, uh, AccuWeather astronomy expert and meteorologist Brian Leda. You can see Brian's work on our website, AccuWeather.com, and also on our astronomy Twitter feed. It's a separate Twitter follow on X, AccuAstronomy. It's a really good follow, uh, highly recommended. Well, don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can always write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at AccuWeather.com. You can also call us or leave us your question at 888-566-6606. Coming up soon on uh, Weather Wise, we're going to have the story on how a lightning strike almost 30 years ago changed the rules for how NASA launches rockets today. It's part of our Weather Wise segment. Yeah, that really happened when we continue. back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. It is time for Weather Wise and a segment we call, Yeah, That Really Happened, where we look at strange weather events. Today, we're looking at when lightning struck a rocket. This happened back on March 26th of 1987. NASA was preparing for a crewless rocket launch at Cape Canaveral. The mission that day was to send a naval communication satellite into orbit, but with overcast skies, weather conditions were poor that afternoon. 48 seconds after ignition, a cloud-to-ground lightning strike was caused by the launch itself, hitting the rocket as it was leaving the launch pad. The lightning caused controls to fail, and the rocket fell apart, sending flaming debris into the ocean during a heavy thunderstorm. Both the launch vehicle and the satellite were destroyed. Fortunately, there were no casualties because, again, there was no crew on board. After the incident, new NASA rules were developed with guidelines to determine if weather conditions allow for a launch on any given day. So, yeah, this event really happened. Lightning did strike a rocket ultimately destroying it. And many of you who are uh, space enthusiasts or interested in these launches that are well publicized these days, uh, you're aware that the weather has to be pretty optimal for the launch to be green lighted. There are often a lot of scrubs because of weather conditions and delays. Thanks again for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Don't forget, whenever you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Thanks for being with us. Have a great one.